you know, when you do Jesus work in Jesus ways, you see Jesus outcomes. Let's do this. Welcome, John Chandler. How are you? I'm great. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, Aaron, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I mean, I'm super excited to have John with us today. He's had such an influence on my life. I know he's had a big influence on your life. We talked about Uptick before. Uh, John, you, uh, your influence on my life uh, is one of the reasons that Ordinary Movement exists. Uh, I can't thank you enough. You know, uh, we talk about um, these people in life that are very famous and name like the top five MVPs in the NFL. And uh, we, we have this little drill we go through in Ordinary Movement and uh, na- name top, you know, five people that won the Grammys last year, on and on. And then we ask the question, name five people that have highly influenced your life or that have highly impacted your life personally. And it's always hard to name the famous people, uh, but it's really easy to name those people that have impacted you greatly. And you are one of my, one of my five, man. And uh, I cannot thank you enough for your investment in my life and, and what it's meant to me. It's, um, it's a very humbling thing to hear. Um, and, and thank you. I will, I will treasure those words. I was uh, thinking as you were telling me about that, my uh, daughter-in-law's father, Neil Simpson, dear, very dear to me. Uh, Neil is a guy who is a four-time cancer survivor. Oh, wow. Um, continued working through most of his treatments, even though they were absolutely grueling. Mm. Um, continues to minister in prisons, um, in, in, in teaching financial literacy to people. He's just an amazing guy and uh, is a great memorizer of scripture. And I know that one of uh, his his favorite scriptures is from 3 John, verse 4. Did you even know there was a 3 John in there? I, I, I and uh, 3 now. John 4 <laughs> says, uh, Belo- uh, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And uh, Neil and Kim have two daughters, uh, Kate and and my beloved Julia, my daughter-in-law, and they both love the Lord and are, are walking in the way that, uh, that Jesus has for them. And Neil's like, that's the end game, right? To see that the people you care about are living and walking in the way of Jesus down the road. Uh, there is There is no greater joy that uh, you know, you're not my children, guys, but you, you're like my <laughs> younger brothers in some ways. Yeah. And, uh, spiritual father, you are a spiritual father. There you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm totally down with that. And actually, I think I'm moving into a stage of life with a lot of people that are um, that that I want to be a spiritual grandfather, and that's mm. that's something that's very interesting in my life. And and I'm putting a lot of time and thought and investment into how to be the right kind of grandfather. Yeah, Aaron, I know that you went through uptick as well. And uh, I, I know John's yeah. had a big influence on you too, if you want to speak on that a bit. Yeah, I actually have a note on my phone from December 12th, 2019. And it is a special day where someone named Jeremy McCommons, it literally says uptick J Mac is what the note, the title of the note is. And um, it was when I was doing the year commitment of uptick that uh, I took notes and Jeremy came in and was sharing on, on a handful of things. And um, I just think that's funny that we're now on a podcast <laughs> years <laughs> later. Um, that's just, that's just a testimony of, of the fruit um, yeah. that comes from intentional relationship and intentional time with Jesus. And, and uptick was a, a, a year long commitment for um, entrepreneurs in our area that I said yes to just in faith, like out of prayer of like, God, what do you want me to do? Like, um, how do I, how do I put action with my faith? Um, and this popped up where you get invited to do it. And I said, yes, and walked through it. It was, it was very impactful and something that sort of set me on a course over the next um, X amount of years. Uh, because after I got done with that year uh, with John and, and, speakers like Jeremy, then I was going, okay, God, what next? And so then later came this thing called ordinary men. And then later came this thing uh, where it was like, okay, now I want to lead my own ordinary men group. And then, uh, you know, I guess two years ago now, I don't know, I'm bad with time, but where Jeremy said, Hey, we want you to come be a part of this, this ordinary movement. And so 
God just kind of put something in motion all the way back then uh, with John that is pretty amazing to see how God's been moving through it all and in each of our lives. And there's the impact is, is exponential uh, because of just saying yes to, to the opportunity. So I'm very appreciative of that, um, John. Well, again, it, you know, it just makes me, it's very satisfying, very gratifying to see uh, your younger brothers or children uh, doing, or grandchildren uh, doing well. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you're on this path. And I would say one of the things that's also very gratifying is I think about the the ways that that uh, ordinary movement and uptick are aligned is that they are both fundamentally communal practices, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that that is the way of Jesus. I often say Jesus didn't do one on one mentoring. Jesus Jesus did one on twelve formation, and sometimes one on three. You know, with Peter, James, and John, and he also interacted in social and public spaces. But the bulk of the Gospels. Um, you know, show Jesus engaged with a small group in how he wanted them to f- be formed in his way and to be on the same trajectory that he himself was on. So, you know, that, that is one thing that I think was, was fundamental to uptick that um, unlike our very uh, hyper individualistic American, North American ethos, you know, in the Bible, uh, people hear the voice of God for each other. Mm. And they do that when they're in community with each other. So I, I see that as fundamental to how Uptick has tried to form disciples in cohorts and how ordinary movements does that with groups of of men and women over time. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you do Jesus work in Jesus ways, you see Jesus outcomes. Mm-hmm. And, and that just is, that's just, that's the end game right there. Yeah, for sure. Well, I just wanted to, I I just wanted to let you know the impact you've had on my life, but also wanted to let you know on this podcast so that others would know uh, how profound um, what you're about to say can, can the, the, the wisdom you're about to, to give us how profound that could be in their lives. Cause I really believe this. I really believe it. And, um, you know, so John, you are, you are transitioning in your job and in your ministry roles um, your, do you use the word retirement? I, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, it depends on really who's retired. talking in the level. It, it depends on the level of spiritual capital, whoever I'm talking with has. If, if, yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, your retirement's going to look much different. And so it's really interesting talking to you through that. So I had a conversation with John the other day. Um, we were just talking through some things and I said, Hey, I really want to have you on the podcast before, by the way, if you haven't listened to the previous podcast that John and I have done, we've done like four of them and they were on uh, discipleship, uh, square circles, semicircles, like it, it's really good stuff. You should definitely check it out. We'll put descriptions in the link, uh, in, uh, descriptions and links below in the description. And um, so you guys can get to those. But man, they are great, I think, great podcasts, not because of myself, because of what John brought to the podcast. But as we were talking, I was like, hey, John, would you be on the podcast again? I'd love to hear what you have to say. And, he, and you ask, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, whatever's on your heart. And then you started telling me about how you're transitioning out of these roles and and secession planning and and what it looks like to surrender and what it looks like next season of your life. You mentioned this thing called third, 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 third. Mm-hmm. Um, all these studies from Harvard. I, I can't even like ask the questions to bring the conversation along. It's way over my head. <laughs> but I know that as you were speaking, like, my, like something was jumping inside of me of like, yes, yes. Like I need to hear this and our audience needs to hear it, which may be weird, may sound really weird. Like uh, you're talking to Aaron's in his thirties and I'm in my mid forties and we're talking about succession planning and third thirds and surrender and all these things. And so before we start down that journey, um, so we don't lose anyone, uh, why is this germane to everyone in our audience? Um, yeah, as we go forward, well, I'll, I'll give two two answers. The first one is is pretty short, and um, and is it is to say, any great leader begins with the end in mind. Mm. So if you're not thinking in your twenties, thirties, forties, fifties about what your end game is, um, and you're not oriented toward that throughout your life, you're going to get terribly lost. 
it's as if I hop on a plane and hope I'm going to Seattle and, you know, fly for four or five, six hours and end up in San Diego and go, well, how did that happen? Well, it's because you didn't get on a flight for Seattle, right? You got to, you've got to determine where you're going and some sense, you, you know, we don't, we're, we're in control of a lot less than we think we're in control of. Mm. So it's not like we say I'm going to Seattle and that's the end of my life, but we purpose these things, right? Yeah. We buy a ticket for these things and we, and we aim and orient toward what we're doing. So, you know, a few degrees off course in your twenties can lead you to ending up in a different country in your sixties. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that's one answer. The, the other is um, we've used this, this construct in uh, Uptick Entrepreneur. It's, it's borrowed from uh, Bob Buford in a book called Finishing Well. And he talks about stages of life that apply also to business. He was a very um, successful business person. And he talks about moving through your life from struggle to success to significance to surrender. Now, you know, the halftime adjustment of your life, the midlife crisis, if you will, is how do we transition from uh, success to significance? Hmm. But I think the, the, the big wisdom, the big nugget of gold to be excavated out of that is the fact that it ends with surrender. And so if you go back to that other illustration I just used about getting on the right plane and beginning with the end in mind and so forth, I think the wise person in life begins with understanding that we are headed towards surrender. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is Jesus path, right? Jesus path ends on a cross saying into your hands, I commend my spirit. His Mm -hmm. final act of life was an act of surrender. So this is where we know we're heading And so the wise person begins to learn how to do that, begins to learn how to surrender long before they get to the end of their life. You know, you you hear stories of deathbed conversions and sort of last minute, um, uh, just before a person dies, turning to Jesus and stuff like that. I'm pretty unmoved by most of those. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I mean, if I'm being totally honest, I'll just say, okay, well, praise God. And that person wasted a perfectly good life on earth doing things other than that, which would have caused joy for him or her and would have made joy through their lives for others. Mm -hmm. So that's not the goal, right? It's not the goal to have the last minute confession. The goal is to train in a life of surrender so that when that final day comes, you can say, along with Jesus, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to learn how to surrender in the struggle. You have to learn how to surrender in the success. You have to learn how to surrender in the significance. And it's it's like building a, a muscle. It's like, I can know more purpose today. Um, I was a reasonable athlete for the better part of my life. So oh, you're I'm seriously, a stud. I saw you meet. You I'm, seri- I'm seriously questioning that. You beat uh, Mark Darty uh, a big time. Uh, some, tennis, some, <laughs> well, I'm having some revisionist history going on right now. <laughs> I'm kind of athlete I was, but um, you know, I can know more than at any point in my life athletically. I could never just get up one morning and say, "I'm going to run a marathon today." Mm-hmm. Um, that requires training. That requires a trajectory. That requires building. My son has completed a marathon, and he talked to me about what his uh, year-long training for that was was like, and it, it's incredible. Yeah. And you can't just. It's the same thing with surrender. You can't just get to a point in your life where you've been in control and you've held on to control and stuff like that all your life, and then you get to my age and you say, "Okay, well, I'm ready to surrender it all, Jesus." Mm. So it's it's a, it's a it's an ongoing part of the fabric of life. And now I've, I'm in a concentrated season where at least as far as the ministry I've been leading, leading uh, I'm in a stage where this is front and center. And this is what's on my mind yeah. uh, every day. What what is like just for somebody like myself that's listening, 
what does it even mean? Like, what is that surrender? Like we're, we surrender throughout our lives. Like we surrender control. We surrender success. Like, like how, how would you practically describe what that, I understand like at the end of life and, you know, the example of Jesus or, you know, that type of thing. But what, like, how would you put that into practical terms for some, somebody like myself? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I would say a few things. One, I would say it's a proper acknowledgement and ordering of the way things really are, right? Okay. All things have come from God. All things are going to God. All things belong to God. And it turns out that God has a whole lot more to say about how the world turns than I do. And so when I surrender, I begin to release the illusions of what I think I'm in charge about, but I'm not really in charge about. And I give those to God and submit myself to God. So um, I had a, uh, when I first began as a pastor, I was in a church that had um, a disproportionately high number of um, addicts in recovery, alcoholics in recovery. And uh, I learned from one pretty quickly that the word ego stands for ease God out. <laughs> And so part of surrender is, is not to ease God out through uh, trying to control and direct and um, manipulate things according to, to what I want. Yeah. You had, a, you had a quote from John Maxwell that kind of talked through that a little. What, what was that? I, I can't yeah. remember it quite often. You know, um, I'm wary of formulas generally. Uh, but, um, and occasionally wary of John Maxwell, but this was way back when in my mid twenties, I was just starting as a pastor and it was when John Maxwell actually was still a pastor. And I was in a tiny little rural church and I was trying to help it be faithful and to flourish and so forth. And he was talking about his own experience and he gave a formula that I thought was absolute revelation. I thought it was Kairos in uptick language. Um, and he said, the, the process looks like this. Pastor moves over, people move up, spirit moves in, church moves out. Hmm. So I say that, say that one more time, John. Past, pastor moves, pastor moves over, people move up, spirit moves in, church moves out. Hmm. So the first step in that is the pastor moving over. Hmm. So this was counterintuitive. It was counter to what I had been taught about leadership. I had a very, you know, I had an excellent um, education and I learned a lot about leadership uh, in that education. Um, but what, what I learned in that phrase is that, you know, the wrong thing to say is if it's going to be, it's up to me. The right thing to say is if it's going to be, it's up to thee. And I, I had to learn to understand that great leadership was not simply the exercise of my own gifts and the things that I'm very privileged, you know, to learn and to know. And I have definitely had a head start in life in a lot of ways. But great leadership is not just demanding and directing according to all of that out of me. Truly mm -hmm. great leadership is to surrender ego and to move over so that others can move up. You know, this is why Jesus didn't, didn't just mentor one person. Yeah. Jesus mentored a group and, um, he moved over, <laughs> he moved over, he moved he out. <laughs> he, moved he, over. he took off. Yeah. He's like, he's, All right, y'all, you guys no, got to about that now. So, he said Legit. in John 14, you know, unless I leave you, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, come. cannot come and be here with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look at all of, all of Jesus' life is an act of surrender. To mm -hmm. surrender leaving heaven to come down, to surrender his status as part of the Godhead, to be born of um, a scandalous, right, um, a marriage in a poor and humble circumstance to submit himself to a family that didn't understand always who he was and what he was doing, to submit himself to his own disciples who 
were, you know, clearly idiots at times, <laughs> um, even to submit himself unto the point of death. And, and wow. it was through that submission and surrender that it says God highly exalted him and gave him the name of all names. Hmm. That's the Baptist preacher starting to come out in me there. No, but I but I love that move over so they can move up so the Holy Spirit. Yeah, can yeah. Move Sorry, move I lost the plot line no, there no, for no. a second. It's, so it's if powerful. you if you move over, you know, if, if if I'm staying in the middle and front and center of things, then what I am also doing is I am occupying all of the space into which other people can move up alongside and lead, and not just lead as a single voice but have multiple voices with multiple giftings, multiple yeah. experiences, multiple talents, all of those things leading in community. You think about um, the, the 12 that Jesus chose and think about some of their, their giftings. And I, I often think about um, the fact that both Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon, the zealot, were among the 12 you know, culturally, you couldn't find two people that would have hated each other <laughs> yeah. any more than the two of them. Mm -hmm. They were different mm -hmm. uh, culturally, financially, politically. Uh, you know, they, they were the people that the other one would have hated. And, and, and yet Jesus called these people to move up into the space that he moved over from and to lead the church. And it's part of why the church as the, the rock on which he founded his movement ever since. So, you know, that, that's the big takeaway is that you, it's an act of surrender to move over in order for others to move up. And it's the spirit that moves into that context of people leading together that help the church to move out into the world and to fulfill its, its kingdom call. Yeah. I think it's hard for some to do because I mean, even just thinking about it now, you do feel like you're the solution. You, you have the answers, whether it's your, whether you're in the business world or you're in the ministry world, you feel like, no, the, I've got the vision. I've got the steps. I know how to do it well. Um, and, and it's almost sometimes you maybe believe a lie that like, all right, well, I'll just do it myself because that will be better. But if we just do it ourselves, do it ourselves and don't move over and, disciple people along the way, like almost slow down. I'm going to slow down because I could do this task in like five minutes, but I'm going to slow down and I'm going to teach someone to do it over the course of an hour. And then I'm going to stay with them so that years from now, I don't have to be the one that's still doing it. And I can create opportunity in other areas or allow someone else to flourish. Um, I think that's hard to I mean, that's a good challenge probably to a lot of both business leaders and maybe pastors or leaders of, of churches and organizations as well. Um, I think it's, you know, maybe, maybe an easier said than done thing. Um, oh, but it yeah, sounds like, definitely. sounds like you're, sounds like you're on the, on the path to maybe writing a book on it, another <laughs> book or something. <laughs> never, never another book. Never. <laughs> we'll take a bolt <laughs> from God out of the sky, but six is plenty. <laughs> Well, I mean, I want to I want to carry on in that conversation, but but something on my mind as we're talking through that, and I, and I talk about it a lot in the context, the micro context of discipleship, like one on one discipleship or the discipleship of Jesus with the twelve, and I think it's where where we as this church, the big C, have, has gotten it really wrong, is we disciple people to depend on us. I'm not that's saying right. that's what we should do, but that's what we have been doing, and and um, uh, it. it whatever, this hurts somebody's feelings and then stop doing it. Um, we pastor in a way that makes people dependent upon us. Jesus, everything he did, he knew he was gone in three years. He knew he had, yeah. he, he knew it when wow. he started, his, he knew it. So it was like, I got to lead in a way because I'm moving over. I got to make sure when I move over, these guys that are moving up have got what they need. Right. And so mm. what if not only in our businesses, because this is very germane to business leaders, uh, but it, ministry leaders as well. But let's say you're not a ministry leader in your mind. You are. <laughs> everybody is. Um, everybody has a work of ministry in their life. But you, you do, you're not leading a formal ministry or a formal business. Well, guess what? You're still discipling people, and we should be discipling in a way that we can move over and they can still continue on and stop making people reliant upon our, us. Yeah. 
I don't want anybody reliant on me. I want them reliant on Jesus. I want to connect them to the vine, move on and connect somebody else to the vine, stay involved in their life in the ways that you do in my life, John, and, and other people's. Um, I, mean, I just it, think it's, it's a great. It's as true. I totally agree. It's as true of motherhood, you know, as it is of leading a business. Mm hmm. Right. The, the goal is not to make your children for the rest of their life dependent on you in a way that they're not able to function for themselves. That's right. You know, the goal is to is to to, to raise children uh, who become young adults who are then able to raise good children who become healthy young adults. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not to foster unhealthy dependency on somebody that goes away. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not, way. you know, I, I can I can run for a long time on this. But if you're not, <laughs> you're not making disciples, you're not being a disciple. It's yes. not like making disciples is an option. It's what Jesus told us to do. And so there's 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 real problems with, you know, having to stay front and center. Our, our culture loves heroes, loves celebrities, loves MVPs, loves superstars. You know, it's it's no longer the um, the Lakers versus the Celtics. It's it's uh, LeBron versus Jason. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know, two other franchises connected with them. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So so let's talk about how that looks in your life. Oh, sorry, Aaron, you were about to say something. I think. Yeah, I was gonna. No, I think you were gonna say what I was gonna say. I was gonna ask yeah, John. Go so, what does it look like? Um, now, I guess where you find yourself in in kind of beginning the make those moves and how does it yeah. look practically? Yeah. Well, um, you know, the topic of succession as, as it's known culturally, uh, surrender, as we're talking about here, uh, this is not a new thought to me. Um, I, I've seen succession in organizations happen very badly or not at all. Um, and so I, I felt uh, pretty strongly about the ministry uptick that, that I've been leading for, um, decade and a half, I felt very strongly that if it were something that God was, um, you know, calling forth, and I, and I believe very much it is, then I needed to, from the beginning, plan on what it looked like uh, to hand it off well so that it can be led in new places and new ways that I probably never would have gotten to or gone to. So um, almost at the beginning of my time with Uptick, I was thinking along these ways. And uh, around the time Uptick started, I met a guy named Paul McConaughey. And Paul is a dear friend and very formative in my life and uh, has led movements all over the UK and Europe and um, honestly, you know, all over North America and the world. And um, He's just a guy I knew. Um, he's a good old British Baptist. So we both spoke the same Baptist dialect. And um, although the English is a very different dialect. Um, and so Paul and I, over the years, cultivated a good friendship. I had him lead alongside and that kind of thing. And we began the conversations fairly early uh, to say, hey, you know, do you think God would ever call you to do some of this kind of work? So I would say it's been conversations about succession have been going on for probably seven, eight years wow. about this. Mm -hmm. And th just this January, Aaron, to your specific question, mm -hmm. we officially uh, switched seats so that Paul has become the leader of the organization and I've become the founder. And I'm committed to kind of staying on until early 2024. And, um, and that's required a significant reframe for me uh, because I, I was trying to think about it. I'm not sure when I last led something where I wasn't sort of first chair. Mm -hmm. I tend to be a, sort of a starter of things. So I tend to end up in first chair from inception. Uh, so, um, it's an adjustment, as a friend of mine puts it, to moving from this is what we're going to do to uh, how may I help today? <laughs> That's a very different question. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a letting go of, of some of what historically has been my pattern for directional leadership and moving into a place of uh, trying to provide where I can wisdom that helps the directional leader um, move, move the organization forward. 
I mean, you have a lot of thoughts around that, though. I mean, this isn't as simple as uh, I'm moving over and, and, and someone's moving into the role. I mean, you, you don't look at – that's why I ask, is it retirement to you? Because I know uh, we've talked about sometimes retirement's a bad word. I, I don't really love American retirement. I know that that's not your heart. So, I mean, you, you've you read books. There's a Harvard study you mis- mentioned to me. Um, I mean, explain to me, like, your plan of – I, I don't know what else to call it, retirement, uh, transitioning yeah. out. Like, yeah. Cause I know you still want to have a very meaningful life. I, I, I have to say, and I'm not there yet. So maybe I'll, I won't be such a critic when I get there. Uh, maybe I'll change yeah. my mind, but I have to say, I don't love the American way of retirement where it's like, Oh, yeah. I did all my work. I'm done. Cause I believe that the best years of especially wisdom and knowledge of most people come in their later years. And it's when they can be extremely valuable. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, as you, as yeah, you know. I, I agree with you. American retirement. I think uh, I could be wrong about this, but I think, um, I think American retirement is based uh, originally in uh, German actuarial tables that were designed to help insurance companies maximize return on investment <laughs> by figuring out when people were going to die and and how to how to charge Makes them sense. for stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that for me, you know, one of the most profound things that's ever happened in my life is to become a grandfather. And uh, you know, my little girls, I always say my, my two girls are God's reward for, for raising those wild two boys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will hasten to say, I don't, I don't think I've ever been closer to my two sons than, than we are now. Uh, but um, having those grandchildren is such a different thing than being a parent. And I think there are just tons of parallels about the role of a grandparent in a grandchild's life, as opposed to being the parent. And, and they're true with the season I find myself in vocationally as well. I, I definitely feel like I am moving. I, I have felt like a call to be a father in the Lord in many ways, or at least an older brother in the Lord for a lot of people for the last 20 years. But, you know, once Nora and Emily came around, I was like, Oh, you know, um, you're going to be gramps, uh, which is what my, what my girls, what my girls call me. And, and that's what I need to aspire to be. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to come up living near four grandparents who just had a profound impact on my life. My parents had a profound impact on my life too, and have a profound impact on my life is very different than grandparent impact. Yeah. It, it is. It and is. in some of it, you just can't know till you get there. Right. Um, one of my friends says being a grand grandparent is the best club that exists in the world that you never knew existed until you got inducted into it. Yeah. And I found that to be pretty true. Uh, and now I'm that guy that has to show you a hundred pictures of their grandchildren. <laughs> but being a grandparent is, you know, when you're a, when you're a parent, when I'm, when I was a father, I'm responsible in different ways for my children. I'm responsible for daily um, invitation and challenge um, to, you know, do the fun, to be Disney dad, but also to uh, reprove and correct and discipline and and these kinds of things and stuff like that, because you have a specific time oriented task in a part of their formation that is irreplaceable. The grandfathering role is completely different. And, um, you know, it, when you become a grandfather, you have the opportunity to have a wisdom role in their lives rather than so much of a training role Mm -hmm. in their lives. And, um, it's interesting. I, I read a book. You should put this on, you should connect your listeners with, with this. It's called from strength to strength by Arthur Brooks. He's a, a professor at Harvard. He's writing, written a lot about happiness studies. If you can believe there is such a thing, <laughs> it's a pretty well-known domain now, but, um, he talks about, um, jumping from the achievement curve to the wisdom curve is the key to aging well. Hmm. And uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty brisk read and an accessible read. He, he writes well and in a way that people can understand this. It's not a brainiac Harvard book, 
But um, he makes the case early on that um, the sooner you figure this out in life, that the trajectory of your life is the wisdom curve and not the achievement curve, the, the better life you're going to have and the more impactful life you're going to have. Interesting. So it's just, you know, being a grandfather, you can't help but but understand that you're on a wisdom part of your life. Hmm. I don't know. Kind of, it's kind of a rambling uh, statement there. So I apologize if that went no. all over the place. No, that's good. That was strength to strength, right? Mm -hmm. Arthur Brooks. Right yeah. Down notes. I'm taking notes. Wisdom yeah, so, notes over here. So there you go. What does that What does that mean exactly? Uh, or what does it look like to go from the achievement curve to the wisdom curve? Uh, what, what is like practically? So like in your life right now, like what is that? First off, what does it look like maybe in the life of somebody that's Aaron and I's age? Yeah. By the way, you're not that old. Like 62 is not that old. Um, that's like the new I'm 40. That's like the new 40, man. Um, but what yeah, does that time. look yeah, like uh, for us, like maybe our generation? And then what yeah. does it look like for, for you in your, in, in your season? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I think the success, struggle, success, significant surrender, that's a great, that's a great framework. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to look in terms of mind frames like that, that give – sort of a path. Um, so that jumping from one curve to another curve um, is, is another, another one. Um, I had a thought and it just left me. This too is part of, of uh, getting, <laughs> getting into your sixties. Arthur Brooks says that book is in the library somewhere, but you just got to go in the stacks and find it. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, here's, here's another one. Uh, Richard Rohr uh, uses the, the image of falling upward. Yeah. And he talks about the first half of life as a time of accumulating, achieving, accruing to yourselves, building, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. And then there comes a point in your life where the proper spiritual trajectory is um, the, way, the way up is down. So releasing... Uh, certain things in your life that were once ambitions but are no longer clearly going to happen and not being troubled by those things. That's one mm -hmm. thing you begin to do as you begin to fall fall upward. Um, valuing wisdom over achievement, again, is another. Learning what is yours to pick up and what is yours to let go so that somebody else may pick it up. That's another task at this stage of life. Yeah. Um, uh, and I ran, I ran across another, um, the, the, this through my daughter-in-law, Julia, in her uh, master's counseling studies. Um, she pointed me to a Harvard study. It's a longitudinal study started by someone named Georges Vallant. If you, it, this is not necessarily a book for everybody to read because it's not a short or easy <laughs> book, but it's called On Aging. What, what is it but again? It's, it's, on aging on aging it's basically yeah. how to be a good old person okay and good old, uh, and good old person good old person <laughs> it's very different that from a good old person good old oh, person. oh good old person got it, good, got it. how to be a good old person hey this is ordinary <laughs> discussions you got to be careful with what you said that's right that's right no but um you know this study um is like the largest longitudinal study um in U.S. history, so it's it's taken place nearly a century, where they have interviewed people, both Harvard graduates and sort of gritty inner city Boston people, and interviewed them decade after decade after decade, and then they have tracked which of those folks have demonstrably satisfying lives and which of those who don't, and then they began to accumulate some of the factors that lead to flourishing lives. So, I mean, like, to me, this is uh, fascinating oh, stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, I would say, I'll, uh, I'll sort of boil down a very long book into I, two major takeaways. I gotta say this has, no, I, this is not an old person's book. This is like, if, if we can figure out how to live a life of how, like, this is like for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. I want to read this thing. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's beginning with the end in mind, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hard to be a good young person if you don't can't figure out what the the trajectory's like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll say two things. Um 
One is, um, I'll say the simple thing first. The people who die with the greatest life satisfaction die uh, with a very rich relational network. Okay. And um, flipping back to Arthur Brooks, Arthur Brooks pretty much says the same thing. He said, you got to figure out in order to get from the achievement curve to the wisdom curve, who are your deal friends and who are your real friends? So there's all kinds of transactional relationships that you have when you're in work, right? Yeah. With your fellow workers, with your customers, your vendors, whatever your construct is. Um, and as soon as I retire, a um, ton of those people go away. Yeah. Deal friends versus real friends. And, you know, what will make for joy after I don't have deal friends is who are the real friends? Who are the people relationally that I want to invest in them and I want to receive from them and we want to live in beloved community? So the, the thing is, though, you don't just show up with real friends the day after you retire. Mm -hmm. Those those are things that you cultivate through your life. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the practices is, you know, figure out your real friends and even potential real friends. And I say, go for it. And I've said to a number of people through the years, I've learned to say this. <clears throat> I'm like, look, this may or may not resonate with you. This may not be something you're feeling. This may not be something that you're interested in and time may tell. But, you know, I just have this sense that we could be really good friends in life. And if mm -hmm. you're game for it, I'll go for it with you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've had a few people that have said, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I've had a few other people that are like, I feel the same way. You know, no, so that's not a real. These aren't strangers yeah, at the gas pump. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't usually go so great. That would, that would be that would be probably some of those. Oh, okay, man. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, right. Sure. Can I just have my gas? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the proverbial person on the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's one big takeaway, you know, and one big factor in my life right now is I have a note on my phone about people who are my uh, actual and hopeful real friends. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to lean into those relationships now because yeah. they're going to be the things that endure on this side of heaven. Mm -hmm. John, right? I see that. I'm in, I'm in a, um, so I live in uh, near a ski resort. So I'm in this, this it's a ski club, right? And there's a, there's a lodge area. And I see these guys, I mean, literally, they're still skiing like four or five days a week and they're upper seventies and eighties. Like I'm not, I mean, like these are 80 year old guys and they're still sitting around a table, eight to 10 of them laughing, telling stories, like the same jokes that I've heard 10 million times, you know, that, that maybe old people say, Oh, that's funny. <laughs> like how many times can they laugh at that same joke? But the reality is they are so happy and they have, they have this community that, that, that are associated with. I see, I see that play out in front of me on a regular basis. And then yeah. I'm sitting there by myself eating breakfast thinking, where are my, where are my buddies? <laughs> like when well, they're all working, right. Or whatever, we're, whatever we're doing and get this age, which is, I think maybe one of the difficulties of what you're talking about. If we're not intentional about creating those relationships when we're so busy, because we all have the excuses not to do it now. Right. So I have kids, I have this, I have that. It, no, nobody looks bad at you if you don't have time to hang out. Right. I understand. Like right. so-and-so doesn't have time. Aaron doesn't have time. He's busy. I'm busy. But if you do that your whole life and then suddenly get to retirement, you have this abrupt, like you're by yourself. I mean, I can see like, if you don't have the end in mind, how you can be in a really bad situation. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't plant no seed your entire life and yeah. expect the crop to come up one day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you said you had two things. Was there another, the two takeaways? Yeah. The the other thing, this is, uh, again, I apologize. I'm kind of weaving all around. No, this, this is great. This, uh, this longitudinal study on aging. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, um, uh, there's, there's a guy named Eric Erickson, who, who uh, was a German-American psychologist, very influential. He, um, was was most well known for um, a theory of 
psychological development on um, uh, throughout the course of of the life, and he is uh, he's he's also noted uh, as the guy who um, who came up with the idea of uh, of an identity crisis. So we can okay. trace that that phrase back to Eric Erickson, and um, essentially Erickson, without going too too deep down the um, down the wormhole, Erickson said there are uh, eight different stages um, in human development over the course of life. So each stage of your life has as its centerpiece, a course, uh, a core task. So, you know, at, at birth in infancy, that, that core task is trust versus mistrust. So you get, you know, theories here about why uh, bonding with parents is so important, um, in the early age and, and, uh, things like that. And then, you know, as you move through, like I won't go through all of them, but it's it's sort of things like autonomy versus shame. Um, gosh, I should remember these things. Um, at some point, com- competency versus inferiority. Um, anyways, forwarding the last two stages in Erickson's um, life stages are generativity versus stagnation which is how, you know, that's a prolonged stage in North American life, because that's what we think in terms of our careers, okay? Mm-hmm. Are, are we generating or are we stagnating? And then the final stage of life is integrity versus despair. In other words, did our life make sense as a whole? Did it have meaning as a whole? Did it hold together that who I really am as I face my, my mortality you know, is who I have presented myself to be throughout my life, or did these things not match up and my life turn out to be not what it should have been? So all of that to say is this longitudinal study from George Vallant in the book On Aging suggests a stage between those last two stages. So between generativity and stagnation and integrity and despair, um, this suggests a, a stage called keeper of the meaning. Mm. And the idea of keeper of the meaning is that the significance of what I have experienced in my life and what is most true and good and beautiful and real, how have I held on to this and handed it off to the generations that are behind me? Mm. That's what makes for the, a good life. So, you know, one of their sayings is biology flows downhill. So the more we think about ourselves, the more we think about our future and so forth, the unhappier we get, the less satisfying our life is. On the other hand, the more we come to codify uh, what is true and good and beautiful and wise in our lives and find ways to shepherd that to the people behind us the more satisfying and significant our lives become. Wow. That's what I'm trying to do, right? Like, it's sort of like, I'm not going to be hustling in uh, a vocational path that requires me to um, form budgets and attend staff Mm -hmm. meetings and do things like that. Those are, you know, those are not unimportant things. They're part of a different stage. I'm moving out of that stage and I'm moving into a stage where I'm trying to say, how can I take what God has given me by grace to know experience? And how can I lovingly hand that off for someone else in a way that they can receive it and benefit from it? And this just doesn't mean that, you know, when you're old, just get to tell everybody how to live their life and how they're doing it wrong and how they need to do it right. But it's distilling what makes for life and offering it as a gift, which may or may not be received, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, and, and, and frankly, to be open to receiving gifts from the younger generations too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I do. I, I love, I am a, I'm going to be a lifelong student. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My, my old boss, John Upton, said there's two kind of people. There's experts and there's learners. And I never want to be an expert in anything because it means I've, I've quit learning. And I plan to learn to the day I die, God willing. 
Yeah. Well, I'm set because nobody's ever going to call me an expert in anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you were talking, and really as we've been talking, there's a scripture that's come to mind that I want to share and just see if it resonates with you as well. But um, it's in 1 Corinthians 3, and uh, it's Paul. Uh, in verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Christ uh, Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If a man's work, which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. And as you were just talking about, you know, starting with the end in mind and the, the things that you've built and that us planning on not just building up for ourselves, but turning around and teaching and building, you know, turning the project, if you will, the foundation that has been laid over to the next uh, disciples or the next generation or grandkids or whatever it is. Um, how much more important is it to be building with these precious materials these things that will be refined with fire and not burned up whereas a lot of people make their success or their foundation on you know how many contracts they want or their money or the things like that and you know here it says like when the fire goes to test those things some people are going to just barely make it through everything that they've achieved is going to they're going to suffer loss but but they'll be saved but but there'll be nothing to show for it and i think as you've been talking like i want to be in the camp of the people where we get tried through that fire and it's refined and it's a beautiful thing that, that God has done through our lives. So I see that significance piece playing out and then how we surrender it and what condition we turn it over in is just as important. Um, and so now the student has become the teacher. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's great, Aaron. I, I had not thought about that Corinthians passage that way, but that is, that is spot on. Hmm. So we're we're gonna we're gonna put a wrap on this for your time purposes. We've kept you way too long today, uh, but here's what I before we wrap. Here's what I want is a commitment that maybe in six months or a year from now we get to rehash and say what have you learned in this journey. I think, man, you have my mind moving. It's hard for me to even yes. uh, continue this interview because I, I I got so many things going through my head that I can't even like come up with good questions. Um. Like anyone listening, I think this is something that I'm starting to think part of what's going through my head is like, we should be studying this in our 40s, not in our mm -hmm. 60s. Uh, because here's the thing. Okay, so uh, you said there's there's two phases. There's one in between. What was the in-between phase? Keeper of the meaning. Keeper of the meaning. So, so keeper of the meaning, uh, really powerful to me. Because Okay, so I look at, I'm trying to put this into words, um, so bear with me. Um, the, the last phase is integrity versus despair, right? So if I know that's going to be my last phase, this is why I think it's so important for people of our age, even 20-something-year-olds, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. teenagers, uh, if I know my last phase is going to be integrity versus despair, can I look at my life with integrity or am I going to look at it with despair that I, that I ruined it? Right. That I, that I just let it go. Right. Uh, I'm going to do things different at my age now to make sure that when that stage is going to come, cause it's certain there's been tons of research to show that it happens over and over again. I want to, I want to die with integrity. I want to lay my head to rest with integrity. So how can I make decisions in my forties to know that I can have integrity at death? Right. And then this keeper of the meaning, it, it, this is so interesting to me. I attended an estate planning, um, uh, speech and it was on secession planning through the estate. Right. And, uh, what was interesting is I thought it was all going to be about wealth, how to influence your next generations with wealth and all these things. Do you know what it was about? It was about the keeper of the, it was keeping the, it was keeping the meaning. It was, if you want to, if you want to succeed as a family, you have to make every, I'm, I'm going to be as brief as I can here, but this is really interesting to me in the context of all this, because this is secular, but it relates so well to what we're talking about. 
It's like you have to interview everyone in that family as they age and get every bit of information you can, like all the, all the nuggets. And that's got to be available for all the family going forward, right? You've got to find out what are the family traditions. Don't let them die. Make sure somebody in the family is keeping the traditions alive. You, you have to make sure that everybody is valuable. Like somebody that's good at money is not more valuable than somebody that's in the arts. Because if you're in the arts, you're in charge of making sure that all the stories get told going forward. And it was mm-hmm. interesting because what, that, what they're saying is you have to make sure the meaning is passed on right? You have to make sure it's not lost or else your family gets lost. And I, I, I just think uh, everything you're saying, I don't know. I, I don't know if this means anything to anybody. It means a lot to me, uh, what I'm saying, at least. Um, I know what John says will mean a lot to you guys, but what I'm saying, I don't know if it mean a lot, but, but it really challenges me. And, and then to bring it full circle in the context of what we all care about, which is the gospel, right? And it's like uh, anybody listening, <laughs> And Aaron, that verse is powerful. I mean, so powerful in the context of this, in the sense that if we want to live, if we want to die with integrity and not despair, there is only one thing our life can be about. There's only one thing it can Mm -hmm. be about for us to live with integrity, and that is for the Lord. And mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm probably making no sense right now, but I'm trying to get my thoughts <laughs> no, together. It, it, it makes a hundred, it makes a hundred percent sense. You know, I, I quote this all the time and I'll say it again here. Uh, one of my mentors, Dallas Willard um, would, would often ask people, what do you plan on being when you're 400? And, um, and you know, however many years we get on this earth, we're not guaranteed 80, Mm -hmm. Um, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, but whatever years that we have on this earth are training toward what we plan on being in eternity at 400 Mm. or 4,000 for that matter. Yeah. Right. So this is, that's what a life of integrity means. It's a life. It's again, back to the marathon training thing. It's a life that throughout is training in that righteousness of that Mm -hmm. living in right relationship toward who God is what our place in the universe is, what God has for us to do is our particular part in that. And a life well lived is lived with integrity where, you know, we're in line with all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing that if anybody that has been around me much, I I don't talk about death all the time, but if you, if you have any deep conversations with me, you know, that numbering of days is a big thing for me and, Mm -hmm. and contemplating the end and the Bible is so clear. There's so many verses about we're but we're but a mist, and we're like the the grass in the field, and we're here today and gone tomorrow. And count your days and number your days. And I think that is what we're talking about is that very thing, right? It's like the Bible's telling us don't get to the end of life and never think about it. Like there's a plan. You mm-hmm. as you would say, John, right? You got to know where you're going. And uh, I love this. I love everything you've said. It's really challenging me. I can't wait to have you on again. Um, I would just say before we wrap up, any final any final thoughts for, for for us or the audience? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I love talking about this stuff too. I'll talk with you guys anytime you want to have these conversations. I think they're the real conversations of life. Um, and I don't remember who said this originally, but I, I heard somebody say one time, you know, nobody... Um, is on their deathbed wishing they'd gone to one more business meeting. <laughs> yeah. no. the, the things that you really care about, if you were given the privilege um, of being a- aware just before you die, and not everybody is, but if you have that privilege, the things that will be on your mind will be the things that you're talking about. Yeah. Did my life have meaning? Did I die with, in- did I live with integrity? Am I dying with integrity? Did I fulfill the purpose for which I was put on this earth? Who is behind me and how will things go with them? These are the things that we care about. And if we invest in these things all along the way, um, we're more likely to, to die at peace than we are to die in despair. Nothing else needs to be said. Guys, this was a great <laughs> podcast. Um, Look forward to the one year anniversary of this one to see to see how, how it went for John and what else he has to tell us. But John, thank you so much. Uh, your mm. wisdom is amazing, and and uh, Aaron, you too. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, thank you for leading well, John.
Well, thank you guys for, um, I just enjoy your friendship and enjoy this kind of conversation. And I appreciate what you're doing, not just in the ministry, which is significant, but I just appreciate the, the brothers that you are. Well, hey, if you have too many awkward conversations about people not wanting to be friends, I would say yes, just so you know. You're in. I would say yes. <laughs> All right, guys, until next time, let's do this. See ya. All right. Take care. See ya.